into the promised land. But I love the fact that Moshe was disqualified. God had to keep his, his uh, faithfulness in correction, but he snuck Moshe in. Anybody know how? I love it. Transfiguration. He snuck him in. <laughs> he got to go into the lab. <laughs> <laughs> in a different way that he got to go in. And I'm echoing, I'm, t I'm tinny, whatever you can do. And when you talk about the running the race also, I love the Paralympics that follow. If anyone doesn't know, Paralympics is for all the special needs. And everyone gets a, a medal. Everyone. Not just one, everyone. And I love that because we're all in the race. And we're all para. <laughs> we're all special needs. Yes. Not one of us is not. <laughs> and yeah. the Lord has a prize for each one of us. And it's not just for the one that crosses the line first. It's for everyone who crosses the line in salvation. So I love that. I love the fact also that uh, Jim Ryan, our Olympic mile runner, what, 1930, something like that? 1968. 1968. Okay. I went too far back. <laughs> anyway. Okay, well, I don't know that. Jim, I know, and he was a believer. He was really struggling in one of his in his races, and his coach could see it. And in the last, there was such a remarkable difference, and he just tore through the last uh, lap. Thank you. And I don't remember whether he won or not. That's irrelevant to the point. But his coach asked him what made the difference, and he said he was just feeling the weight of it. It was so heavy, it was so hard, his legs felt like iron that he was trying to pick up and he was talking to the Lord. And he said to the Lord, you know what? Lord, if you'll pick him up, if you'll pick my legs up, I'll put him down. <laughs> and that was the difference. <laughs> Amazing God. Amazing praise. And I have a riddle for you tonight. That's why I didn't want you to look at him. <laughs> what am I? I look at you, but you don't see me. You carry me with you, but you don't notice me. All people need me, but they don't feel me. My very existence is a miracle, but many don't know it. Let me give you a little more description, okay? I'm a spherical shape. No, 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 no. No, it has a shape. It has a shape, a spherical shape. I'm completely transparent. My diameter is no bigger than one third of an inch. It's nine millimeters. And I'm only four millimeters thick. My volume is tiny. It's only 0 0.06 cubic centimeters. Just imagine, I am 30 times smaller than a ripe cherry. I've almost given myself away. I'm one of the most important organs of your visual apparatus, the lens of your eye. I am an irreplaceable part of the eye. Both the human and the animals that see, the dragonfly, that eye, consists of thousands of individual compound eyes. The dragonfly, amazing. Each individual eye is equipped with a half million switching elements. Each of these functional elements are a hundred times smaller than the smallest switching element in your modern computer technology. <laughs> How's that for my mate? Each individual eye has its own lens, and more accurately, micro lens. And that gives a whole new meaning to micromanaging, doesn't it? <laughs> How your eye functions, for every image you see, an optical image of 130 million individual, individual cells is processed in cooperation with the still unknown processes of your nervous system is a high definition image of the thing that you're observing and is generated inside your brain. This highly complicated process 
is largely beyond the understanding of our scientists. Hello. Oh. <laughs> the eye has the ability to see sizes, shapes, colors in various circumstances, and it's all working with the brain for that accuracy. It also has the ability to recognize and remember objects, situations, organisms, humans. It even has a kind of precision which cannot be described in terms of physical measurements alone, but it enables you to recognize a former classmate at that class reunion that you went to, even though there have been changes as time has passed. And guess what? I just scratched the surface. <laughs> Uh -huh. Right, right. Oh, I would believe that. If you're not hearing her, the ophthalmologists are among the most brilliant in our the scientific world. has a thousand eyes. You know how little a dragonfly is? Those eyes have to be just little dots and then you, you're breaking down that dot. Alright. And that, that involvement of the material synthesis along with the production processes along with the miniaturization it has two completely different proteins that have to work together. That Here's where it, okay, evolution, really? Yeah. Really? How do these two proteins know how to come together at the right time to work together to produce what this eye is able to do through this lens? Yeah, and, and it can't even be corrected or changed, so there's no evolutionary process. It's either on or it's not. Okay? Now, I've just described to you, I've explained to you a minuscule and I love the book that I took it from, which is the Van Lens Could Talk, but it talks about the human eye in that book. But I love the fact that it gave this scenario. It said, it's like, what I did for you, it would be like if I took one, one screw and said, this is a whole car. Or if I took one brick and said, that's Buckingham Palace. That's about how good I covered the lens of the eye. And Darwin himself said, and I quote him, to suppose that the eye, with all its inimitable contrivances for adjusting the focus to different distances, for admitting different amounts of light, for the correction of the spherical and the chromatic aberration, could have been formed by natural selection, seems, and in his own words, he says, I freely confess, absurd in the highest degree to think that could just come together in an evolutionary process. The lens and the eye must work together at the same time and correctly, and yet evolution cannot plan ahead, and this cannot be modified. Amazing. You know what comes to mind? Shmote, Exodus chapter 4 and verse 11. But the Lord said to him, Who has made the human mouth? Or who makes anyone unable to speak or deaf? or able to see or blind. Is it not I, the Lord? And take that with the Holy with Psalm 94, 9. He who planted the ear, does he not hear? Or he who formed the eye, does he not see? <laughs> what a magnificent God we have. And I chose this tonight to start off. Now, if you want to know my title, it's The Eyes Have It. <laughs> and I chose it tonight because this is Shabbat Chazam. This is the Shabbat, a vision or prophecy. Usually it's translated vision, but prophecy fits in well. And it's important to have both because to have vision 
is to see prophecy. You really can't see prophecy if you don't have vision. And originally, we looked at Yeshyahu, and that's why we had the, the battle from Isaiah tonight, also chapter 1. And I'll let you read it on your own. I bring to you what you're supposed to study all week. So I get to start it off, I get to ignite you, I get to get you excited, I get you to think, I want to check this out and that out, and that's what I hope you do. Then you get to spend the whole week doing that until we come next week and start with the next. So when you're looking at this and you're thinking with an eye and you're, you're seeing the amazing view from God as creator, in chapter 1, it says, this is the vision of Yeshua. This is the vision of Isaiah concerning Yehuda and Yerushalayim, concerning Judah and Jerusalem. Shema, heaven. You know what I just said because you know the word well. Hear, heaven. Give ears, earth. God is calling on heaven and earth to listen. He's got a prophecy regarding Judah and Yerushalayim. And this is critically important. And then he goes into a recitation of Israel's history. Uh-oh. God brought them up, but they revolted. They rebelled. Their way down with iniquity. Their descendants are evildoers. They are immoral. And he even goes so far as to say they have abandoned Adonai. Notice who abandoned who. Because I hear all the time, well, where did God go? Where is God? Hello? He hasn't moved. Where are you? <laughs> Where are you? Verse 5, it says that the whole head is sick, the whole heart is diseased. There is nothing healthy. And I think what Bruce could do with that verse. <laughs> verse 7, your land is desolate. Your cities are burned. Your foreigners are devouring your land in your presence. This is sad that it was the vision God was giving of what was coming. Because Isaiah is speaking prophetically to uh, Assyria that's about to swallow up the ten northern tribes. And why is that happening? Because they have abandoned God. Because they're not in obedience with Him. They're not following Him. They're not listening to Him. And yet God said, I'll keep my hand on you. And He says that in verses 9 and 10. It says, if God had not left a tiny, tiny remnant, then Israel, you would have become like Sodom and Amorah, like Sodom and Gomorrah. And we know they don't exist. They're, they're gone. No one says, oh, I'm from Saddam. <laughs> I'm from Mora. And nobody would want to admit it if they were. <laughs> Verse 15. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I will hide my eyes from you. Multiple prayers, I will not shma. God speaking. And that seems like, wow, wait a minute, God, why would you close off to them? That those hands that they're holding out in prayer, he goes on and describes them. Those hands are covered with blood. That's quite a, a, a statement. Sorry, I'm fighting for words. Verse 16 says what needs to be done. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. You remember how we talked about the water? That it cleanses and it refreshes. And the spring that should be bubbling up and filling us and pouring out from us continually. And that's where he brings in the description of the Torah again that the sins could go from crimson to white as wool, or white as snow, or whatever description you want to give. That again, I won't go into the Tola now, but what a change. What a transformation. God is telling them, you're, you're in sin, you're in error, you're suffering consequences because of it. But I'm here. I'm holding on to a remnant. I am here to cleanse you. Come, let's reason together. Let's talk. He never said, that he would abandon. He never said he'd leave them, and he never said it was over for Israel. Never. Remember our video? I will bring them back home again. And there will be the day they will never be uprooted again. Hallelujah. That just gives me chills. And when we go into verses 24 and through 27, the end of chapter 1, here is our prophecy. And it's Adonai Sabaoth that's speaking, the Lord of hosts, this is the mighty God of Israel. This is the mighty God that we say that defends us. He will take vengeance on his enemies. He will cleanse them of their impurities. He will restore judges. He will bring advisors. There will be a city of righteousness. You know what city that is? That's Jerusalem. Jerusalem will be a city of righteousness, a faithful city, and Zion, Zion 
name for Israel will be redeemed. Hallelujah. Israel, you don't need to worry about whether you'll be here tomorrow. No matter whether Iran gets that nuclear weapon that they're trying, no matter whether Hezbollah sends out a thousand missiles on Monday or not, God will be your defender. Now, Let's get Israel back right with her God so she doesn't have to suffer any consequences, so there isn't any of what is going on. We're still in exile. We haven't all come home yet. He hasn't brought us all back yet, but he is faithful to his word and he will do it. But just as Israel needs to hear this today, Shema Yisrael, we can say that same thing for the time with Yahshua. They needed to hear it because they were about to get their minds blown away. Wait a minute, where am I waking up? I'm no longer in Israel. What happened? How did I get out of the land of promise? And they could have felt as hopeless as I'm afraid our hostages may feel right now in Gaza. But God sees. God's eyes are not closed. And God knows. And God is at work. And he did warn them. He warned them repeatedly. By the time we come on down, we've got also with Yermia, he is speaking to the two tribes, Judah, that were left in Israel. The ten northern have been taken, swallowed up by Assyria. We're less than a hundred years later when the two northern, two southern, sorry, the two southern tribes are going to be swallowed up by Babylon, who's swallowing up Assyria because Babylon's the one on the rise. And he's telling them, Jeremiah is calling it out for what it is. You're going to go into captivity for 70 years. Now, that's not the end of Israel. That's a period of time. And they needed to accept that. The false prophets were saying, oh, everything's going to be fine, or it'll be a year or two. No. Jeremiah, Jeremiah <laughs> told them, settle in, build homes, plant crops, and have children. Because you need to come out in numbers. You need to not diminish. You need to grow. There's a future. There's a hope. How many times do we pull that verse out? Hear me at 29, verse 11. For I have the future for you. For I know the future I have for you, says God. Future for hope. Future plans. This is what God is saying. That it, yes, we can apply, but don't steal it from Israel. God spoke it to Israel. He spoke it to the nation of Israel, and he wanted them to have that vision. He wanted their focus to be sharp. He wanted them to see 2020. He didn't want a cataract over their eye. Yes. <laughs> Remember last week? May I have a word with you? Remember sometimes it is a word of correction. But they are words to live by. And Israel needed to hold on to every word from God. In good days, in bad days. In times of trial, in times of joy and celebration. They were to keep their vows. We talked that last week, how serious that was. But there was also a time when there would be correction for not keeping and not being obedient. And that's what they were going into. Says so Yasha, who is prophesying captivity by Assyria. And, and that happens in 722 BC. We see Jeremiah again prophesying for the two southern about Babylon in 586 BC, about 140 years between the two captivities. But they were both having the same common denominator. And God called it out. He said, you brought it on yourself. Jeremiah chapter 2 and verse 17, haven't you brought this on yourself by abandoning Adonai, your God, when he led you along the way? That cloud didn't disappear. The fire was always there. They were walking away. And this is where he makes it very clear. It's for the time. It's for correction. That God promised both. Northern tribes and the two southern. He promised both. I will bring you back home again. He never left them without hope. The most devastating was the fact that they lost the temple. Now I bring all this out in the background of where we are on the Jewish calendar because Bruce alluded to it and, and really he summarized my whole message in two sentences. Thank you very much. <laughs> what happened on Tisha B'Av, the ninth of Av, in our Israeli history, it is the saddest day on our calendar. There's just no other way to, to look at it. I can run through some highlights real quickly. Both temples, 
the temple, the first temple that was built, and the second temple that was built. Both temples were lost on that day in history. In 136 AD, Jerusalem was utterly destroyed. Um, the day of the bad report by the Tian spies, I'm out of order, but that also was on this date. And uh, I don't want to get rid of that yet because I want to read that to you. Uh, but moving fast, just jumping to show you how it's continued. 1290, all the Jews were expelled from England. 1391, 13, I'm sorry, 1391, 4,000 Jews were killed in Toledo and Yaon, Spain. In 1492, is that a familiar year, America? In 1492 was the expulsion from Spain, the last day for the Jews to leave that country. You know when Christopher Columbus set sail? How many of you know that they got on his ship and sat for 24 hours before that ship left the harbor? Does anyone know why? It was the 9th of Av. And Christopher Columbus has Jewish roots. He knew this is the day we mourn. This is the day we fast. We do not work. We do not set sail. And they did not set sail till the 10th of Av. I can bring it up to date, 1914, the Jewish people were attacked in Eastern Russia and World War I was declared. In 1942, the Warsaw massive deportations from the Warsaw Ghetto to Treblinka, you know where that ended. In 1944, Kovno Ghetto was liquidated. In 1970, Libya confiscated all Jewish property on that day in the calendar. And that's the day that around saying it through Hezbollah, and we're going to attack Israel like she's never been attacked yet. I pray to God we won't stop that evil. But they want to do it on that day because they want to rub salt into the wound. But again, even knowing all of this, when we take it to our biblical time, what matters most that is also relevant to today with our, our religious, with those who care about God, was the destruction of the temple. And why is that the worst? Because remember, the temple was where God's presence went. It was where heaven and earth met. It's where they knew that God's presence was there and would speak to them and would forgive them and would guide them. And if I read you this paragraph that I didn't want to skip, for 830 years, there stood an edifice upon a Jerusalem hilltop. It served as a point of contact between heaven and earth. So central was the edifice to the relationship between man and God that nearly two-thirds of our mitzvah, nearly two-thirds of the 613 commandments are contingent upon the existence of the temple to be able to carry out those commandments. The greatest tragedy of our history, the rebuilding will come, but the greatest tragedy is losing the temple, losing that place, where God's presence dwelt. But they look to the future and they say that there is the ultimate redemption, the ultimate restoration when they're in harmony within God's will. Creation and the God of creation and what he created will come back into that fellowship when the redemption is, is nigh. And I think, wow, they don't even know what they're saying, but they are so right on. It's amazing what happened on that time. And because of that, our Jewish people do mourn that day. There are those who fast and daven, saying the prayers. And the prayers are begging God for uh, forgiveness. They read lamentations because of the mourning and lamentations. And again, they miss it though. Right in the middle of lamentations, chapter 3 has some of the greatest verses of hope that his mercies are new every morning that great is his faithfulness and I just want to cry out hear that Israel, Shema Israel Shema Israel, hear it hear it, they get caught up in trying to show God how serious they are about getting uh, uh, not, not forgetting this date, so they take away all kinds of privileges nine days building up to it which we're in right now, almost like Yom Kippur, and this day is only second to Yom Kippur, and in some ways because of the timing, it's even more so. They abstain from anything of pleasure, 
Some will not even bathe the 24 hours if they up to that, but they won't use perfumes or aftershaves. They won't wear leather. They won't greet others. They won't receive gifts. They won't celebrate what you can do in a marriage, and they won't have marriages. There's no musical instruments. There's no music. The music is, is gone. They won't engage in business. Some won't even sit on chairs. They'll only sit on the ground. And all that they study out of the Word of God is all what has to do with mourning, like the Book of Lamentations, and making all these prayers for forgiveness. Maimonides, the, the revered rabbi who helped codify uh, Judaism and what it is today, he pointed out, though, this is not to remember the hardship that our people suffer. This is not to be remembered in the same way we remember a day of joy or we remember a day of sorrow. He says, that's not the point. The point is to awaken our hearts. Awaken our hearts. Clear the path to repentance. Start getting that heart right. Turn that heart toward God. That's what he was saying. So that's the point of remembering. The, the point is that God wants to bring us back. Don't miss that. Don't just mourn, but look for the joy. Because underlying in this current, there is this current of joy. The Hasidic, the ones that are ultra, that are really trying, they say, expand our vision, and I think of the I, expand our vision and imagine the maximum redemption of our nation and personal redemption of each and every one of us. Wow, once again, they're so close. If they could just see what they're saying, because that's the whole crux of it. We want to see the whole nation return and be redeemed, but it's also every individual soul that has to be. God cast a greater vision. He wanted them to focus on Him. He wanted them to see further. He wanted them to have that ability to have that 2020 vision, and He promised in that vision, you will return, you will be redeemed, and you'll never be uprooted again. That means October 7th, there will be a time in Jewish history for, for coming, coming, not the past, <laughs> the future, sorry, in the future, a day like October 7th cannot happen. There will not be one that's uprooted and taken out of the land. What a promise, Israel. Grasp hold of that. Don't miss that. Lamentations 5.21 says, Turn us back to you, O Lord, and we shall be turned. Renew our days as of old. They're longing to come back. Longing to that time of fellowship. Longing to the time when they came into the temple and brought in their first fruits. And they were singing and dancing. And remember all the joy when they had that water libation ceremony that I described to you a few weeks ago. Coming back to Zechariah, the prophet Zechariah, um, chapter 8, verse 19, Adonai Sabaot, that mighty God, the Lord of hosts, he said the fast days of the fourth and the fifth, the seventh and the tenth months are to become times of joy. You know what the fourth and the fifth months are? Fifth month is off. So it's the, the, the ninth of Ah, Tisha B'Av. And if we back up where this season started, we started in the fourth month, Tammuz, and that was the time when the spies, uh, I'm sorry, not when the spies rejected, the Moshe came down from Mount, see, from Mount Sinai, sorry, I'm all over the page of my mind right now. It's when he came down, they were worshiping the, the, the golden calf, and he broke the commandments. From that day to Tisha B'Av, that's the period we're talking about. That's the fast of the fourth month and the fast of the fifth month. And God said those are going to turn to joy. Those are going to become joyful. And then it talks about the other feasts also, but we'll just focus on the two right now. He ended that verse with saying that it become times of joy, gladness, cheer for the house of Yehuda. Therefore, love, truth, and peace. And I think, hmm, love, truth. Who was it that said, I am the truth? And who brought shalom? I give peace, not as the world gives, give I unto you. Let not your hearts be troubled. 
This is so easy. They could just see if that veil of blindness would be removed. If that lens would work the way God intended it to work, it's Yeshua on every page of their scriptures, in every prophecy. It goes on and it says, yes, provide for those in Zion, in Israel, those who mourn, give them garlands instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, a cloak of praise instead of a heavy spirit or a fainting spirit, so that they will be called oaks of righteousness planted by Adonai in which he takes pride. Wouldn't you love to be a tree planted by the Lord that gives glory to him and he takes pride? And that tree I hear in Psalm 1 is watered. The one whose roots go down deep because he's being watered by the Lord. That's good news. That does turn a day of mourning and a day of sadness and a day of depression because that's what it is when we look back on it. But that will make Tisha B'Av become the happiest day of the year. What a change. And it will happen because what God promised, what God prophesied comes to pass. So Korea, we will see it. And our Jewish people all say, and may he arrive soon and in our days. Do they know what they're saying? They're crying for Messiah to come. That's who the He is. The one who's going to turn the morning into joy, the one who's going to bring this to that fulfillment is none other than the hope of Israel. You know what the hope of Israel is? Messiah, Yeshua. That's it. The mighty one of Israel. Yes, He promises comfort. And do you know we go from, from Shabbat Chazan? This vision, we go from three Shabbats in a row that this one has ended with of rebuke and correction, and we go into seven Shabbats of comfort. Every single one will focus on comfort. And what is the comfort of Israel? It's found in Messiah. It's found in the, the setting up of the kingdom. It's found in the restoration of the temple, because worship is returned to Israel. The presence of her God is there, and he fills place. Not just a little where he fills the whole temple. <laughs> and he read it in Yeshua. Oh my goodness. The vision he saw, I don't know how he kept his feet on the ground. <laughs> Lord, take me there. I want to see what he saw. <laughs> There's a parable that's given. It, it, it's called Mashal. It's given for Shabbat Hazan for this season. And it comes out of the Hasidic tradition. That's our ultra-Orthodox again. Rabbi Baruch Mezabush, I don't know if I'm saying his last name right or not, but he's a grandson of the Baal Shem Tov, who was the founder of the Hasidic movement. Okay, and this is his story. He said he found his young son crying. And he asked his son, what are you crying for? And the boy replied, well, my friends and I were playing hide and seek. And when it came my turn to hide, I hid. And after a long time of hiding, I realized that the, my friends, they stopped looking for me. They forgot all about me. And so he was just full of tears. He was lamenting and he was crying. And Rabbi Baruch calmed his child down. And then he said to the others that were around him, this, is this not precisely what God cries about? He hid from us as a result of our sins. Remember when God said that? We read that early in Yeshua in Isaiah chapter 1. But the purpose of his hiding is so that we will seek and search for him. And the one who seeks and searches for God with his whole heart will find God. That's what's written in Dabarim, Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 29, which will be our parasha next week, and Yermia chapter 29, and verse 13. But like the child, he went on and said, we stopped looking for him. They lost their focus. They lost their vision. The cattle is over their eye. And it's sad, but it's true. That designated time of mourning over the destruction of the Holy Temple, the resulting Galut, the exile, that's still going on today. We are still in exile. Not all Israel is home yet. We have physical exile, but sadly we have spiritual displacement. And that's the greater issue. That's the real crux of it. 
And I cry out to my beloved Israel. And I say, have you stopped looking for him? Are you missing him? Are you missing out? Let him give you vision. Let him give you eyesight. Because he hasn't moved. You've moved from him. He's right there crying, wanting you, seek me, search for me, don't forget me. I only hid so you'll want me all the more. And we can take this, and we can take it into our lives today, and we can make it personal in whatever we're suffering. Maybe we feel like we're in exile, and maybe we feel like we've been abandoned. And maybe we feel like this is the worst day and the worst time. And maybe we are bringing out a litany of all the wrongs that have been done to us. And so many times we get caught in that. And we say, where's God? How could he let this happen? And I hear that all the time. But that's not, that's the wrong focus. Because that's not what God is saying. God is saying, I'm here for you in every bit of your suffering. I'm here hoping that suffering, that problem, that issue is going to draw you to me. That you're going to want to run into the arms of the one who is the mighty God of Israel. That you're going to want to come back into that place where you felt my presence. Where you knew this is where I was. And I'm not talking about going on feelings. You can't trust feelings, folks. Your feelings will lie to you all the time. But I'm talking about the reality that God never moved away. He didn't abandon you. He didn't forsake you. And he said that in Hebrews in chapter 6. He said, I will never, no, not ever, no way, no how. Five different ways in Greek to say no, and he used all five of them. So three of them, I won't abandon you. Two of them, I won't forsake you. How many times do you need it? Five gives you grace. The grace of God. And the grace of God will never take you where God can't keep you. So no matter what you are feeling, God is there to uphold you. God is there to strengthen you. God is there to bring you back into a fellowship with him if you walked away. He has never closed the door. Just like he never has on his beloved children, those he called his own, his people, Israel. When we look at our eternity, when we look for the vision, when we look to the future, if we look with eyes wide open, we have a choice. We can go into an eternity of suffering, or we can go into an eternity of joy. But it is a choice which path we're going to follow. I love the fact that, that Roger had a bumper sticker for a while that said, Eternity, smoking or non-smoking? You have your choice. <laughs> but God is faithful. And he never says, oh, you can't come into the joyful side. He never says your morning won't turn to joy. And if it takes your morning to find his joy, hallelujah. That's what can come out of pain and suffering. Because often, just like the children of Israel, we don't listen until it gets a little bit uncomfortable. We were happy down in Egypt. We were land, living in the land of Goshen. Everything was good, but 400 years later, we're in slavery down there, and we are suffering, and we are finally help God, and boom, here comes Hush onto the sea. God is faithful. Yes, Shadow Isaiah 12, 1 through 3 says, On that day you will say, I thank you, Adonai, because although you were angry at me, your anger's now turned away. You are comforting me. See, God is my salvation. I am confident and unafraid, for Yah, Adonai, is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. Then you will joyfully draw water from the springs of salvation. Remember our water? And Yermia, chapter 31 and verse 13, for I will turn their mourning into joy, comfort, and gladden them after sorrow. Verses 31 to 34, some of my favorites. God says, I'm going to give them a new heart. 
I'm going to take out that heart of stone and I'm going to put in a fleshy, a soft a heart. I'm going to circumcise that heart. It's not external, it's internal. And when he does that, he says, I'll be their God and they'll be my people. And I don't know about you, but I want to be the people of God. I want him to be my God. And I rejoice that I don't have the hope he'll choose me because he already said, I've chosen you. I will be your God. You will be my people. And then he says, I'll remember your sins no more. Hallelujah. It's not going to be hung out on the laundry line for the whole world to see. It's gone. It's forgotten. And when Satan reminds you of your past, remind him of his future. Tell him, take a flying leap. He knows where he needs to go. And he'll go right back there. Amos, Amos 9 verse 15 says, They'll no more, no more be uprooted from their land, which I gave them, says Adonai, your God. So Israel, yes, there's a hope. There's a future. You're coming back to your land. And I will bless you in that land. And I will fill that land with my presence. And it will go out to the whole earth. Can you imagine this world praising God? Ha! Ah. As I see the evil that's just running rampant, that's coming up to our eyeballs, and we just feel like we're in this cesspool, it's going to totally be different, completely different. And I love, I love reading about the new temple. Remember, the worst thing on Tisha B'Av was the fact of losing the temple. But God didn't leave it there. He gave them a vision. He's got chapters on it. You can start with Ezekiel 40 and go all the way to 48 to get the whole picture. God spent time giving detail. He colored it in, and I love it. This, by the way, is not the third temple. There will be a third temple during the tribulation time. It will be desecrated by the Antichrist. It will be destroyed. As you should return, that will be wiped out. There's going to be a whole new geographic area because that temple mount, is too little. Let me tell you, the first temple built by Shlomo, Solomon, beautiful. So beautiful that when the temple was built again, those that were still alive that had seen the first said, you know, this is nice, but it's nothing like our original temple. And they mourned for the beauty of the first. The third temple, all I can say about that is the vault because that's just going to be atrocious at the end, atrocious. When, when the Antichrist puts himself in the place of holy of holies and says, you worship me or your dad, that's what happens at the third temple. He takes it for himself because that's what Satan's been trying to do all the way since the garden. I want them to worship me. I want my property back. And he thinks it belongs to him and God says, ah, 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 ah. I am the one who owns heaven and earth. And I give it to who I say. And he brings his son and the worship of his son into that temple, that fourth temple, that temple that Hezekiel, Ezekiel saw. Let me tell you, just in, in brevity, go read all the chapters, but that mountain complex, Shlomo's was 500 by 500 cubits. Now, I can't imagine that, but I can look at pictures of the Temple Mount and get an idea. Okay, you know what Ezekiel sight is? <laughs> 3,000 by 3,000. Who, 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 boom! <laughs> 36 times larger. 9 million square cubits. 22,325,625 square feet. And the only thing I can begin to wrap my mind around is when I was told it's 512.5 acres. Okay, I, I, I know what an acre is, so I got to go 500 times up. Wow, I think I know what an acre is. I probably don't. <laughs> the Kodesh HaKadoshim, the Holy of Holies, that building stays about the same size, but it becomes like a square around it. That courtyard is so different. It goes from 135 square cubits of the second temple to 312 by 317 square cubits. So again, it's like three times the size around it because there's so much more that happens in that area. God had to make room for it. And Hezekiah's prophecy says, 
they'll go up three times a year. They'll go up for the three major Jewish holy days, but they're also going to go up every new moon. You know how often that is? Every month. Every month they're going to go up. And Tony, our Hasidic rabbis say, the clouds will transport us. Interesting thought. I've often thought, how is it going to work in the Millennial Kingdom? When everybody has to come up to worship, I realize it's bigger, but when you're talking about everybody has to come up and worship, and I guarantee you, there's not going to be gridlock, honking horns, smog from the exhaust, <laughs> or any other issue. And I thought, hmm, will God, because of what the cloud represents, will he bring the clouds down? And people will get in a cloud, and it will take them, and the big transport. It's an interesting picture, especially when I know cloud by day or fire by night. Hmm, our Hasidic may not be so far off. I don't know. Maybe that's not a view you like. But the Hasidic also said that this temple will be built with iron something that's never been used before. And I thought, well, why did they go there? And then I found it very interesting. Iron we use to make weapons of war. But in the millennia, it says that the implements of war will be beaten into plowshares, but the swords will not be swords of war anymore. So they believe that iron is going to be used in the temple because you can't use anything associated with war in the temple before. So it wasn't before, but it will be now. However it's fit, however the transportation happens, the most important fact is it's still a very sacred place. It is still where God's presence will be. That's what it's all about. And when you realize what God has said to you today in this day and age, when you have opened your heart for your Messiah to come in, that you become the temple and the Ruch HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, is with him. Wow. You don't have to look far, do you? We see right here, now. What is your focus tonight? Where's your vision going? I hope none of you have a cataract. I hope you all have a little sharper image. Your lens is working in a way that's phenomenal, showing you the God of creation because I will tell you, the eyes have it. Oh,